Well, welcome, Dr. Sachin Panda. That was a phenomenal speech um, and a TED Talk. You've got some very innovative concepts about blue light and our circadian rhythm. In a nutshell, what do you hope that people will take home from this talk? Well, there are two things people will take home. One is uh, they will pay attention to how much light they're getting. So hopefully they will spend a little bit more time outside during the day. And that's a great way to reduce depression and fork up our mood and also at the same time get a little bit of exercise. At the night time, they will also be paying attention to bright light. So for example, they may be dimming down light uh, in the kitchen, living room, or in the bedroom. At the same time, they even uh, think about uh, changing the light bulbs or putting dimmer switches uh, in throughout the home. So a number of different accommodations that anyone can do even right now before yeah. all of this uh, scientific implementation and in the hospital settings and the yeah. daycare and school settings you mentioned. Yeah, so for example, in hospitals, if you're going to a hospital or the, your loved one is in the hospital, you can even think of uh, having a simple eye patch, sleeping mask, uh -huh. um, so that this person can sleep, at least get some sleep. Uh -huh. um, at the same time, you can also think of having a hospital room that has a window so that the person can get much better daylight during the daytime. So these are many things in many different ways that we can uh, implement this. Even for schools, now we can think of how to have larger windows and maybe let, let kids go play outside a little bit m longer instead of sticking them into some this club and then the other clubs that they spend more time. It's striking, as you say, larger windows, I realize that there are implications for architecture, there are yes. ur urban planning, there's yeah. implications for all sorts of systems. What would you hope five to 10 years out from this research you'd like to see in our world that's different than it is now? Yeah, so we are actually working with architects, uh, lighting engineers, and also organizations that set the building's guidelines. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the whole idea is uh, the lighting guideline that's currently in place is to help us perform our task, to read something or write something or find our way. But it's never designed to improve health. Mm. So now that we spend almost 90% of our time indoor and we move from one place to another place, so the designing for lighting for health has to affect almost every building. So yeah. we're trying to figure out where um, actually uh, part of the a team that's writing this guideline, how lighting should be used in different scenarios, mm -hmm. for example, museums, schools, hospitals, etc. Mm -hmm. So we are very uh, hopeful that in five to 10 years, uh, it will transform at least there will be lights that will automatically dim or change color, and lights that will increase intensity uh, if the person is depressed or something. Mm -hmm. So the technology is already there. Just putting the pieces together is what it will take. <laughs> and what will it take to put the pieces together? What would the infrastructure need to be in order for the c c people at the table, people to come to the table and have the conversation yeah, you're so having with us today? So there are a few things. One is there has to be more research on the research side to show that yes, changing indoor lighting alone is going to boost health. Mm -hmm. And right now, most of the studies is to give people more daylight um, or right. taking them outside or taking really bright uh, light. Um, but doing some of the studies will actually help convince people that yes, this is what they want. Second thing is, uh, for example, in hospitals, if we change the lighting system in hospitals in a way that it's good for the patient and also good for the people who work there, we also have right. to keep them in mind. So the nurse station might have different lighting system than a patient's room. Mm -hmm. And some of these are actually being implemented and tried, so in the next couple of years, we'll see the research results coming out, and that will convince people to adopt these changes. So there's a great deal of research right going on right now, right now that you're looking f to be completed. When would you say? What's your time trajectory? I think uh, there are many research in many different groups that are going on, so they're uh, yeah. already coming out, some of them. Yeah. Uh, so that will help. Another thing is, as I said, uh, we just had a circadian lighting in space station. And if the astronauts say that they're actually feeling better, they're <laughs> sleeping better, because you know there are so many technologies that were first tried in the International Space Station, 
and then we adopted them. So similarly, some of these have to come from, uh, have to trickle down, yeah. and some, some other stuff has to kind of rise up. Yeah. And we're kind of at the right moment and the right time. Because at the same time, if you think about it, for the first time in human history, we have the ability to change the quantity and quality of light from our light bulb. Mm -hmm. And we haven't used it creatively. Mm -hmm. So lighting companies are craving to use it creatively and to add values to light so that we can adopt them. So I think all these market forces, research, and uh, health education are coming together to mm -hmm. make this happen. I think about the number of people walking around with Fitbits right now, yeah. and you <laughs> talked about that being an archaic uh, yeah. tool to regulate our well-being. What would you imagine as the new best technological advance when it comes to circadian rhythm management? Yeah, so for example, right now, we have watches that are sensing our blood pressure, uh, heart rate, um, surface temperature, uh, body surface temperature. Um, so just uh, adds a light sensors to it. And mm -hmm. then another thing is we are not analyzing data to look at the circadian pattern. We are just saying, okay, my heart rate is X or Y, but we are not looking at how that heart rate changes over time uh, throughout the day and night. For example, there are many uh, people uh, who have high blood pressure, and when their blood pressure doesn't go down at night or their heart rate doesn't go down at night, then that disease is much more severe. Right. And they're already using these watches, but we are not extracting and analyzing that data. Right. So that's like the lowest hanging fruit that we can capture to see the circadian rhythm in our heart rate, blood pressure, s body surface temperature that can be used right now. And then if we combine that with sleep cycle and also lighting information, then we'll know how lighting affected this person's sleep, how lighting affected this person's mood mm -hmm. or heart rate. Yeah. So capturing that data yeah. and recognizing that as a variable that's been underemphasized in, in managing health and well-being, it sounds like you may be onto the next huge technological advance that could trickle down to each and every one of us right down yeah. to the time we have our flu shot. So you gave us that yeah. tickler during <laughs> your, your talk. What's the best time of day to have a flu shot? Well, so there are two different uh, things to flu shots. One is uh, if you didn't have enough sleep, then getting that flu shot will not give you that much benefit. Okay. So having a good night's sleep for at least four to five days before flu shot, that's important. And second is, uh, people who take the flu shots in the morning are likely to have much better titer or much better protective uh, function of the flu shot okay. than people who take late in the afternoon. Okay, so <laughs> you heard it here first. Get your flu shot in the morning. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck to you. Thank you.